Hi, welcome to Health Watch. I'm Cindy Berry from Ledgelight Health District. This program is the second of a three-part series on Lyme disease. Our first part included an interview with Dr. Kirby Stafford from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station about deer ticks, their abundance, and the diseases that they may cause for humans. Today we'll be talking with Russ Melmed, who's the epidemiologist at Ledgelight Health District. Welcome. Thank you. So today we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the diseases that, lo that uh, deer ticks can cause and the prevalence of those diseases here in southeastern Connecticut. Sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what an epidemiologist is. Oh, my favorite subject, myself. So uh, an epidemiologist uh, takes on many roles. <clears throat> in a local health department like Legislative Health District, um, my job responsibilities are varied. Um, I take care of all the district infectious disease surveillance. So we're looking at <clears throat> the diseases that are most common in our area. We're asking questions like, in who do they occur most often? When do they occur most often? Um, how, how often do they occur in general? How severe are they? Um, are we seeing more people with diseases or fewer people with these diseases? And that's a sort of very classic role for an epidemiologist to play, is looking at those kinds of statistics and data and trying to paint a picture of um, the health profile of our community. Mm -hmm. uh, I do some other things like um, I do program evaluations. So at the health department, we have a number of programs, uh, health interventions that are attempting to um, improve the health profile, the health outcomes of our population. And we like to evaluate those things. We like to see, are we doing a good job? Are we not doing a good job? How can we improve them? So um, I look at data related to the programs that we uh, implement, and I try to understand where we can improve things. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to Lyme disease and tick-borne illness, that's another thing that we hear associated with deer ticks, maybe you can define tick-borne, sure. but also why is the health department interested? Yeah. So tick-borne, you might hear other types of diseases like um, mosquito-borne or food-borne or something born. Uh, it just applies to the way in which uh, the, the disease is typically transmitted to humans. So food born would suggest that we get sick by ingesting food that has a particular organism in it that makes us sick. Tick-borne diseases are diseases that make us sick, and we get them from ticks. So when ticks bite us, mm -hmm. they transmit the infections to us. Mm -hmm. um, the three most common tick-borne diseases that we see here <clears throat> in our area, and in Connecticut in particular, our Lyme disease, which of course mm -hmm. just about every one of your viewers has heard of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. Or Probably, had it. Or had it or mm -hmm. knows somebody who's had it. Mm -hmm. um, babesiosis and mm -hmm. anaplasmosis. And mm -hmm. those are the three that we um, look at most often here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about each of those individually a little bit just so people get an idea of the signs and symptoms of those. Um, but let's talk a, a little bit about your own concern uh, for southeastern Connecticut. Yeah. <clears throat> Why are you interested here? Uh, well, you know, just Historically, Lyme disease was first identified here in a group of um, young children. So there was an astute um, pediatrician who noticed a bunch of young kids who had um, symptoms that were normally reserved for older adults, like arthritis. Mm -hmm. um, so Lyme disease was first identified here in Connecticut. Uh, it um, is the most common um, vector-borne, so that's another word, tick-borne. A tick is a type of vector. It's an insect vector. So it's the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. <clears throat> And it's the most common vector-borne disease here in Connecticut, of course, also. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we see a few thousand cases in the state of Connecticut every year. The CDC estimates that there are 30,000 cases, or there are 30,000 cases reported wow. in the country every year. And they estimate that that's underreported or underrecognized. They think that there's roughly 300,000 cases wow. a year in the country of Lyme disease. <clears throat> and uh, most of those cases occur in like 10 to 15 states, mm -hmm. Connecticut being one of them. Mm -hmm. So we have some of the highest rates of Lyme disease of anywhere in the country here in Connecticut wow. and here in southeastern Connecticut. So the diseases are prevalent here. Mm -hmm. um, they are difficult to diagnose, which we can get into later. Sure. Um, and they cause a significant amount of morbidity. So they cause a significant amount of illness among our residents. So mm -hmm. really that's why we're concerned. They make people sick. In some mm -hmm. cases they make people very sick. Um, and in some cases they can linger for mm -hmm. a long time. Uh, so the consequences of those diseases are high. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're concerned with them. And also, they are preventable. Yeah, that's you know? the other thing people forget. S right, so they're preventable. So from the health department's perspective, yeah. uh, if, there are, if, there are, if there are ways to prevent diseases, 
and they are causing problems, health problems in our community, then we want to target them. Mm -hmm. So it's become so prevalent. Uh, do you think that people have become complacent when it comes to prevention? Yeah. We've been living with Lyme disease here since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, there was a huge amount of awareness around it in the late 1980s and the early 1990s around how you get Lyme disease, the ways to prevent Lyme disease. There was a lot of money spent in, in tracking Lyme disease here in the state of Connecticut and making physicians aware of um, what Lyme disease was and how you test for it and diagnose it and report and all those things. And so there was this huge amount of awareness. And uh, as with anything, you have a huge uh, outcry about something. And over time, enough people get the disease, they know enough people with the disease. Mm -hmm. Typically, people aren't dying from Lyme disease. And so, um, yes, I think people become complacent. You know, mm -hmm. they've had it before, they've been treated before, they know somebody who's had it before. Uh, and so we live with these things every day. Car accidents are another example. People die of car accidents every day. You know, 50,000 people die of car accidents. Right. We still get into cars. You know, yeah. do you, are you hyper concerned every time you get behind the, the wheel of your car? Or is it just something you've grown accustomed to the risks? Right. So I think Lyme disease is no different. That we've lived with it for so long. We see it in a lot of our friends, relatives, ourselves. That, yeah, I think we've just gotten complacent. So why a task force? And can you talk a little bit about what was it in the data that you look at every mm -hmm. day that prompted you to want to establish a task force to really take this on again? Sure. So the health department is really good at asking questions. So as an epidemiologist, I'm really good at asking questions. Like, how prevalent is the disease? In which populations do we see it? Um, the health department can do certain things to try to reduce those uh, outcomes. But we really need partners to help us. Mm. You know, people who deal with the populations um, that are at greatest risk, young children. So um, people who deal with childcare and daycare and, and kindergartens and preschools and camps. Um, older adults, so senior centers and walking, hiking clubs, gardening clubs. Um, those people are at greatest risk. So as the health department, it's really important to bring those partners together uh, because we need their input and we need their help reaching those populations. Sometimes the health department um, isn't well connected to every person or every population in a community. So we need those, those people who are connected. So task force brings all those people together in a way that um, sort of um, amplifies the work that any one person could be doing. So mm -hmm. that's really why task force. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about some of the specific diseases because I want to give people a, an idea of kind of what we're looking at at the health department and what the task force is really going to be mm -hmm. doing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Lyme disease what it is, how it's transmitted. You talked a little bit about who's most at risk, but what are some of the symptoms that somebody should be looking for if they've been exposed to an infected tick? Sure. Um, so first I'll say that when you're bitten by a tick, you don't immediately get Lyme disease. And there are a number of factors go into that. Some, not all ticks carry Lyme disease. Somewhere between 30 and 40% in any given year carry the bacteria that cause Lyme disease. And it is a bacteria, so it's a spirochete, um, called Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's the actual infectious agent that's harbored by the tick. So just because you're bitten by a tick doesn't mean you get Lyme disease. Um, the tick has to be attached to you for a day or two before it actually transmits. So if you pull a tick off very early, um, you're not likely to get Lyme disease. <clears throat> but let's say you're unlucky enough to be bitten by a tick. It's harboring the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, and it feeds on you for a couple of days and it transmits that bac bacteria. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the first sign that you're going to look for is a rash. Often that rash appears at the site where the tick bit you. So if you're aware of where the tick bit you, or even if you start seeing a rash and you, you weren't aware that the tick bit you, the, the presentation is, looks like a bullseye, or it'll be an expanding rash. It'll look mm -hmm. like a small raised red circle, mm -hmm. usually where the tick bit you, but not always. And over a number of days, that red area will expand in a ring. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger, sometimes as big as 10 centimeters in diameter, so wow. a fairly big ring. Mm -hmm. um, it'll have a central area that's clear. It'll be white like regular skin or, or clear. Mm -hmm. And in the middle will be a raised red bump. So it'll look like a bullseye, a central bump, and then a ring around that. So that's the first sign, and that's a very classic symptom of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And if you're unlucky enough to get Lyme disease, <clears throat> you can consider yourself fortunate if you see that rash, mm -hmm. because that's screaming to you, I've got Lyme disease. The reason it's important is because the other symptoms are what we call nonspecific. We call them nonspecific because they can relate, they can be symptoms for a lot of diseases, not, not just Lyme disease. Things like fever, 
headache, myalgia and arthralgia, which are body aches and, and muscle aches and, and joint aches. So the basic not feeling good. Not feeling good. You know, the same yeah. symptoms you might get with a mild flu. Feeling under the weather, you, know, you might have flu, might be some viral illness, could be Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So those are the early stage symptoms of Lyme disease. The rash occurs in about 70 to 80 percent of cases. <clears throat> so if you're lucky enough to find the rash, then you know it's Lyme disease. Late stage symptoms are somewhat worse. You have severe swelling in the large joints like knees and hips. You'll notice swelling. Some people will get a facial palsy or Bell's palsy where half the face starts to droop a little bit. Um, you'll get severe fatigue, severe exhaustion, severe headaches, neck stiffness in some cases. Um, some neurologic issues, problems focusing and concentrating. Um, in really severe cases, it occurs very rarely something called Lyme carditis, where you'll have an irregular heart, heart rhythm. Mm -hmm. So it can, the, the bacteria can affect so your So it's heart. really a lot more serious maybe than what people think. It can be very serious, yeah. The, the later stage symptoms can be very serious, mm -hmm. yes. So there's another um, infection that's called babesiosis that you're saying is becoming more prevalent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's become more and more prevalent. Um, just about every year we see higher rates of the disease and that may be because uh, the awareness of the disease is increasing and so physicians are becoming more aware and so they're including that in their differential diagnosis when somebody presents with some symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, or we actually may be seeing an increase in the, the prevalence of the disease because more ticks are carrying it. Right. So, and what are some of the symptoms that somebody would look for? Yeah, babesiosis couldn't, couldn't be more different in terms of the actual um, infectious agent that causes the disease, but the symptoms unfortunately are somewhat similar to Lyme disease, mm. nonspecific. Fever, body aches, muscle aches, fatigue. Um, so those are some of the, the, the sort of non-specific symptoms that you have with babesiosis. And you babesiosis. can get them at the same time. You can. Unfortunately, ticks are really great carriers of these organisms. Mm -hmm. They can carry the organism that causes Lyme disease and the organism that carries babesiosis at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you can get one or you can get both. You can also get what we haven't talked about yet, anaplasmosis. Right. So that's another one that you can get from ticks. Right. So the 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 symptoms are similar mm -hmm. between babesiosis and Lyme disease? Yes. Babesiosis, um, in some people, like in many people, you won't have any symptoms at all. I see. So unlike Lyme disease, you could get bitten by a tick, you can get babesiosis, and you won't notice a change at all. Uh -huh. If you're a healthy person, you might not get sick at all, and your body will clear it of, of this. It's a parasite. It's not a bacteria. It's a single cell parasite. Okay. Um, your body will clear the infection, you'll be fine. But for some people, it's a problem. Some people, it's a mild infection, mild, mild mm -hmm. symptoms, and those go away on their own also. For a minority of people, people in certain risk categories, those will be very young children, um, older adults, people with immune systems that are compromised, either from undergoing chemotherapy or some immune suppressive therapy for chronic inflammatory disease, like if you have Crohn's disease, you take some immune modulating drugs to, to, um, to help with that disease and people who've had their spleen removed, <clears throat> mm -hmm. babesiosis can be extremely severe, okay. extremely severe. The body does a really good job of clearing the parasite if you have a healthy immune system. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you're at risk for extreme complications from that disease, and it can kill you. And then let's finish up this first half by talking about anaplasmosis, because that was something that you also said was a, a very common yeah. tick-borne illness. It's the third most common tick-borne illness here in the state of Connecticut. It's caused by a bacteria. It's a, a rod-shaped bacteria called Anaplasma phagocytophilum. Uh, that uh, acts a little bit differently. It's a different kind of bacteria. It's also not a parasite like, like Lyme disease, uh, like a babesiosis. And also, unfortunately, non-specific symptoms mm. with anaplasmosis. Fever, aches and pains, fatigue. Um, in some cases, you'll get some nausea and some confusion. And that disease is more, it's rare. You're, more, it's, you're less likely to get the disease, <clears throat> but you're also more likely to have some severe complications from that disease. Um, you can have uh, kidney issues, liver issues, breathing problems with anaplasma. So um, it can be very severe. Yeah. So now that we've scared everybody, we're going to come back in our second half and talk about prevention, what great. people can do so that they can enjoy the great outdoors this coming summer. Um, and also just uh, mention that May is Lyme Disease Awareness Month, so we're hoping that people will also access some of the great information about Lyme disease and ask questions of their local health department if they have questions. Sure. So we'll be right back.
hey, look, it's those guys. Uh, Are you good to drive? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Getting that college education? What are you going to do? Graduate and take some office job? Be like everybody else? Or will you dare do something different? Like be a teacher. You could be my teacher. You got the skills, the smarts. Yes, you. You could be the teacher I never forget. That would be cool. Does that corporate job even have recess? What are you going to make of yourself? What are you going to make of me? Welcome back to Health Watch. We're talking today with Russell Malmed, who is the epidemiologist at Ledgelight Health District. And we're really talking about and focusing on Lyme disease as a, a part of a three-part series. Um, so let's uh, continue our conversation, Russ, and, and talk a little bit about um, how you had mentioned that some of these diseases are underreported. And can you talk a little bit about why you think that is? Yeah, I think there are a number of reasons why, in particular, Lyme disease is underreported. Um, what we've seen over the years, is especially in the early 1990s when there was a lot of awareness activities and there was a lot of money flowing to the state to train physicians and, and um, uh, there was an emphasis on reporting and the Department of Public Health was making phone calls to physicians when they got a laboratory report to ask them more information about the case. Um, there, were, there was a, a, a spike in reported cases. Yeah. Um, now, some of that might have been due to actual increases in the the burden of the disease, um, but a lot of it was just in training and, and education and awareness. <clears throat> what we've seen since then, since like the early 2000s on, is sort of a steady decline in the cases that are getting reported. And in part, I think that's a, it's a comfort level that physicians have now with the disease. Some physicians will see you present with symptoms, and they won't bother sending a blood sample off for testing. They'll say, you know what, this seems like Lyme disease to me, I'm going to start you on treatment. And, the way we count cases for Lyme disease is by getting those physician reports and those laboratory reports. So as people get, as physicians get more comfortable with dealing with tick-borne diseases, they're less likely to send things off for expensive tests that maybe they think are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, and so all that goes into reporting. So we just see fewer reports because of that. Um, I think also what we're seeing is, um, is a number of, um, of issues with the testing protocol. So even if um, you send a blood sample off for testing, uh, in some cases it's too soon for the test to detect mm -hmm. an antibody response, which is what the tests look for. If you're infected with, a, with a, a disease, a lot of tests will look for your antibody response to those diseases, but it takes a number of weeks for those antibodies to build up enough in the blood, bloodstream for them to be detectable by the, by the test. So let's say you go into your doctor and you say, having these uh, symptoms, headaches, fatigue, I'm never tired, doesn't make sense. I was bitten by a tick last week hiking and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm concerned about, about Lyme disease. The doctor will say, I'm concerned about Lyme disease too. Uh, when did your symptoms start? They started just three or four days ago. Okay, I want to send you off um, for testing. Here's a, a lab requisition slip, go off and get tested. If you get that sample taken within a week of starting symptoms, most often your antibody response is not going to be detectable. So you're going to see a negative test result. So we're not going to get a case report of Lyme disease because it's a negative test result. Sometimes those physicians will say, you know what, even though this test was negative, I'm still going to treat you for Lyme disease because I'm really suspicious. We can't count that as a case. Mm -hmm. so, so this is just an artifact of when the tests are ordered mm -hmm. um, and, you know, is the test mm -hmm. going to detect mm -hmm. the disease. And what time of year do you see more, most cases of Lyme disease or more cases? Yeah, we see most cases, the vast majority of human cases of Lyme disease we see in June and July. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because that's when people are most active outdoors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the summer season here in Connecticut. We have beautiful spring and early summer yeah. weather. Everybody likes to get outside gardening, hiking, going for walks, taking your dog for walks. Parks are active. Um, children are at parks, at camps. So. 
So we have a lot of people in Connecticut who are going out into tick habitats. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see a lot of cases mm -hmm. in June and July, most cases. So in terms of personal protection, what are some of the things that you and your task force are recommending? So what we recommend for people if they want to prevent or do their best job to prevent getting Lyme disease, A, just be aware of your surroundings. Know where you're going. Are you going into an area where you know there are going to be ticks? Those are wooded areas or areas with any low brush. Or it can be around your yard. It can mm -hmm. be around your mailbox. Mm -hmm. It can be anywhere you see brush. Um, if you're going to those areas, just be aware those are prime tick habitats. Mm -hmm. If you're hiking, stay towards the center of the trail. It's towards the edges where you're going to brush your leg against the tall grasses or the weeds or whatever that, that you're likely to, to encounter ticks. So stay in the middle of the trails if you can. Mm -hmm. um, before you go hiking, dress appropriately. Okay? I know it's not going to be a very popular recommendation, but when you're going hiking, or you're going to be gardening, or you're going to be in tick habitats, wear long pants, light colored long pants if you can. Mm -hmm. Tuck those pants into your socks. Wear a so you can see ticks crawling light on you. Light colored clothing yeah. so you can see the ticks when they're crawling on you. Mm -hmm. Tuck your pants into your socks. Tuck your shirt into your pants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the thinking is it, most ticks you're going to run up again are going to find your lower legs. Mm -hmm. Okay, if your shirt's tucked in your pants as it crawls up, it's going to continue crawling up your shirt. Okay. If your pants are tucked into your socks, it's going to crawl up your socks and then up your pants. Instead of going under your pants, to find a nice comfy spot in your groin area where ticks love to bite you. Mm -hmm. So dress appropriately. <laughs> yeah. Spray insect repellent. If you have insect repellent, use it. Um, use it according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, you know, depending on, on how long you're going to be exposed, you can use different concentrations of the products. DEET mm -hmm. is what's usually recommended. Okay. So use DEET. You mm -hmm. can also treat your clothing with um, things that will kill the ticks if they come into contact with. Mm -hmm. Permethrin is one of those agents that you can treat your clothing with. You can even send bags of clothing to companies. They will impregnate your clothes with permethrin. So if you are a landscaper oh, or yeah. you If you're using the same clothes mm -hmm. to do gardening all the time or you're somebody who works outdoors like you're a landscaper mm -hmm. or, you're a, right. or you work in public works, you can have your clothing treated. And then after you come inside or you're done with yeah. your hiking for the day, what should you do? Check yourself from head to toe for ticks. Okay, check yourself for ticks. Um, if you pull a tick off within uh, 24, 48 hours after it starts biting you, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be in good shape in terms of Lyme disease. Also, shower. Showering within a couple of hours after coming in from being exposed to ticks reduces your risk of being bitten by those ticks. So shower those ticks off before they latch onto you. Okay, and also I think that there's a recommendation about drying, putting your clothes in the dryer. Yeah, so if you've been exposed to tick habitat, you take your clothes off, you're ready to get in the shower, you're going to do your tick check, take your clothes, put them in the dryer immediately. Don't wash them first, put them in the dryer on high for 10 minutes. Ticks are really susceptible to drying, so that'll dry them right out and kill them, so right. you won't have them crawling around. Great advice. So we have about four minutes left, Okay. and I want to uh, make sure that we get information in there about what to do if you find a tick has attached to your body, mm -hmm. what should you do? Yeah. Uh, so, if you find a tick that's attached to you, um, get a fine tip tweezers, grab the tick as close to the skin as possible, as close to where it's, it's embedded as possible, really right up against that skin. Don't squeeze the body of the tick, get right close up to the mouth, grasp it firmly, and pull slowly with firm pressure. This can take a minute or two. Don't yank it out. Mm -hmm. What's likely to happen is you're likely to break the tick, mm. and you're likely to squeeze some of the contents of the tick into your body where it's bitten. You may leave the mouth parts in there. So firm. Steady pressure. A lot of people panic when they see a tick attached. They just want to get yeah. it off as fast as possible. Yeah. Firm, steady pressure, pulling out one to two minutes, and it will eventually let go. And Great. it will pop right off. That's how you do it. Don't Great. coat it with anything, none, none of that. Pull Great. it off. And Ledgelight does offer tick testing as a service. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, if you have a tick and it's been embedded in you for a day or two, it's been feeding and it's slightly engorged, so it looks like it's been feeding for a little bit, but it's abdominally distended with blood. You can bring it into Lightside Health District, bring it in a rigid container. You know, not only a lot of people have film canisters anymore, but a pill container or something. If you don't have that, it's okay to bring it in a Ziploc bag. If the tick is still alive, throw a couple blades of green grass in there just to keep it from drying out. Mm -hmm. Bring it into Lightside Health District or your local health department if you're not from Lightside Health District uh, jurisdiction, and we will send it off to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, Great. no cost, and, and they'll test it for all Great. three major diseases. Great. Thank you so much for being here. I know that uh, this is the second of a three-part series on Lyme disease. Next month, we'll be interviewing Petey Reed, 
who is a landscape uh, la landscaper and owns Perennial Harmony. And she'll be talking about deer resistant plants and really the modifications that people can make to their own yard to reduce the deer population uh, on their yard and also to hopefully control ticks. Great. So we're really excited about this. Thank you for all you do at Ledge Light Health sure. District. And if you'd like more information, please give us a call at the Ledge Light Health District or uh, find the CDC's website at cdc.gov. Uh, they have a great uh, bank of information and photos about Lyme disease and other tick-borne illness. So thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful day.